We start with a view of the international exhibition that occurs in 1867 uh, in Paris, and I had mentioned this a few times before and kind of the effect uh, this, that this had uh, on the local artist. Again, we, we take it for granted, uh, the multiculturalism that we kind of experience uh, in the contemporary, and we forget that Oftentimes in the past, this was not the case. Uh, so in 1867, uh, there was a, an international exhibition where uh, different countries provided booths. We have uh, Ireland. Uh, there was even booths from the United States. But the really noticeable one uh, to many of the artists was there was actually an entire kind of setup uh, dedicated to Japan. And, and again, when we look at the uh, contemporary events, we see uh, Japan kind of connecting more with the West at this time. So this was kind of a big uh, connection, if you will. You can see this little kind of faux Japanese village that they set up. It kind of always reminds me of uh, uh, kind of colonial Williamsburg, if you will, but in a Japanese formula. That was kind of what they were, were, were having. Uh, and, and again, uh, this had a profound influence on the artist of the time. Uh, they brought, this was the first time that a lot of Japanese art was on display to many people. Uh, and again, we also see this kind of fetish of Japanese culture uh, appearing in art at the time. And, and it, it's kind of humorous because when you look at a lot of this stuff, uh, it's kind of the fake touristy knockoffs that you're really kind of seeing uh, displayed in people's homes homes rather than uh, what you would think of as authentic, really, really fine uh, pieces of Japanese wear. So this Japanese style or this Japanese influence shows up in, in a tremendous amount of the art at the time, sometimes directly. Again, we see this painting from 1875 of Madame uh, Manet, who we will we will speak about a little bit more in detail in, uh, a little bit later. But uh, you can this is almost a display of the Japanese culture from uh, this very elaborate kimono uh, that almost looks like a rug she's wrapped around her body to uh, the wonderful fans that we of course have in the background. But uh, when we look at these fans again if you really think about uh, uh, what you're seeing there these would be kind of touristy items uh, much more than anything else not to say uh, that they the artists weren't influenced by Japanese prints and, and that type of thing uh, so there was kind of this genuine uh, artistic flair that you uh, uh, kind of see stemming from Japan we also see more military uh, and very political kind of statements as well. We have the, ex uh, the, the execution of Emperor Maximilian of Mexico. Uh, this was an emperor uh, from the Habsburg dynasty that was essentially put into power uh, in Mexico, supported by Napoleon III in France. And then uh, when things didn't work out, they kind of just abandoned him uh, to the fate of a firing squad of the locals. And again, when we see this, uh, this is kind of... Manet's uh, political statement because they're wearing uh, French military uniforms and, and uh, the people that were executing him, of course, wouldn't be wearing uh, that type of outfit. So uh, this is kind of him saying that the, the, the French government, uh, their hands are dirty in this, so that, that they uh, have a direct role in uh, kind of leaving this person just in the balance of, of, of fate and not uh, uh, continuing to support them. But as we can see, you know, as we kind of focus back to the art here, uh, we have a variety of these paintings around the subject matter. The previous one we saw, uh, incredibly realistic in aspects, but as we move to the background, more and more abstract. But this one, uh, again, very abstract in the foreground. When we look at the individuals, uh, he's almost kind of uh, just synthesize their faces and a lot of their bodies together. Uh, when we look off in the background, we see this thick, thick plume of smoke, uh, and we see these figures kind of peering through where before we could definitely see Maximilian, uh, not so much in that painting. Luncheon in the studio, and we have Su Suzanne Lienhoff, uh, who is actually Madame Manet from the previous image. Uh, she's a very interesting story where uh, they're married in 1863, uh, the, uh, I believe the same year that, that Manet's father dies, and this is important because uh, we can see this boy here, Leon, uh, who was born in 1852, and it could have been uh, either 
Edward Manet or Edward Manet's father's uh, child. We know that he he's, has Manet DNA in him, but we're not sure which one. Uh, Suzanne was kind of uh, the, the, the nanny, if you will, of the two Manet boys. Uh, and, and as they continued uh, on into life, uh, they continued to have a relationship with each other. We see Leon in a lot of uh, a lot of work by Manet. He's a frequent model that appears in, in one of the earliest images we believe we have of him. Uh, is again boy with a sword from 1861. Uh, as I mentioned, he was he was born uh, out of wedlock. She wasn't married to anyone, and then. Uh, again, as, as they kind of continue their relationship down the road, they were very close to each other. Obviously, they had uh, a relationship for many, many years, but it wasn't until uh, Manet's father actually passes on that they, they are married to each other. Uh, and again, we see uh, uh, her in, in a lot of the work, and we do see uh, this boy, uh, Leon, quite prominently in a lot of the paintings as well. Uh, again, when we look at this uh, and we look at the different figures in the balcony, and this is again something that we have uh, a lot of conversation about for many reasons. I believe that's Bird Morceau sitting in the front, uh, uh, the woman with the darker hair sitting. But in the background, again, we see uh, Leon most likely with the tray. But again, these balconies, if we think about, there's a lot of uh, revisions that are occurring to, uh, uh, to Paris, both before and after uh, the Franco-Prussian War. So this is one of these uh, newer kind of things, these new balconies that they have looking out onto to the street level. Uh, so again... A lot of this painting is as much showing the contemporary technology or the contemporary scenes of the time uh, as much as anything else, a collection of people. Uh, and we do have a, uh, the Franco-Prussian War, a wonderful image from these uh, from 1870 to 1871. And again, when we look at the military uh, outfits that we have here, they're very similar to the, what we were seeing in the, the execution of, of Maximilian. Uh, again, we, we need to remember we have a period of building before, uh, but we have a major period of building after the Franco-Prussian War as well. And a lot of this is kind of the modernization of Paris, uh, taking Paris from, from kind of this medieval city uh, and really kind of pushing it forward uh, into kind of a contemporary. So a lot of the work that we see from the Impressionists, and I'm also thinking about Degas, another artist we'll look at, uh, uh, eventually very soon here, uh, a lot of what we see is, is kind of this contemporary uh, view of what's actually occurring in Paris at the time, a lot of the rebuilding of the streets uh, and this type of thing. It's also around this time, if, if you're really kind of paying attention, that we kind of see a change uh, in the subject matter of Manet as well. Uh, you'll notice that before this, the vast majority of, of the paintings that we're seeing uh, are all paintings that are done indoors, uh, again, still life's portraits, uh, and, and kind of these put together compositions that are mostly made from sketches and that type of thing. Uh, but as we continue, uh, into his career, and this is especially true uh, as he becomes friends uh, with, with people like uh, Monet, Claude Monet, uh, and some of the other Impressionists, Bert Morisot, uh, we really do kind of see him moving more and more outdoors. Uh, again, this kind of Orientalism that we have uh, occurring in Paris at this time, not just in terms of Japanese culture, but uh, in, in terms of a lot of the different cultures that we uh, have around the world. Again, uh, this fascination with the exotic is, is really kind of uh, the bottom line of, of what's occurring. And if you think about the people uh, who would most likely be purchasing these paintings, these people who would have the money uh, to invest in a, a painting made by a professional artist, most of them are going to have kind of artifacts or pieces uh, from a lot of these different cultures as well. So a lot of these paintings kind of just fit in nicely uh, with the overall aesthetic of what's occurring with a lot of the wealthier individuals of society. Uh, and the railway, one more time we return with Victorine, and, and Victorine returns for this painting, and, and again, we, we remember Victorine uh, from many of the many paintings that we have before Luncheon on the Grass and also Olympia, and here uh, we can see that she's very much aged quite a bit. 
I always think that this is this kind of crucial painting uh, showing this transition of life, if you will, that almost uh, uh, the youthful part of life is over. And, and as, as we view through Victorine, uh, that we've kind of moved on to a later space. Uh, in the background, we have the famous Saint Lazare train station, which we will also see painted uh, by Claude Monet.